I have always been a careful motorcyclist. I bought a bike because a car's costs are more than I can afford, both the upfront and the fuel costs. I don't even particularly enjoy riding motorcycles. I hate it when it rains or snows. I always just wish I could be under a roof and behind a functional windshield. I never go for joy rides or try to pick up girls with my bike, and if I did, they'd probably run screaming for my 2006 Honda Dream 125cc. Seriously, it has a frickin' metal basket in the front. It's not sexy at all. I never fail to wear a helmet. I use all the appropriate signals when I'm driving. Careful. The small Ontario fishing town where I live just recently installed the town's first traffic signal, and some of the more established locals aren't quite used to it yet. I was going through this intersection, and... One of these established locals didn't notice that their light was red, probably forgetting it was there, and ran directly into me, hitting my right leg with their front bumper. People always describe dramatic experiences like they happen in slow motion. This one didn't. I didn't notice that anything had even happened until I felt the crushing pain and even heard the crack in my right femur. I remember hitting the windshield, the next moment, I was on the ground, screaming in unbearable agony in the red snow that surrounded me. I was rushed to the local health clinic, where they nursed my wounds and stopped the bleeding as best they could as they waited for the helicopter ambulance to take me to a better equipped hospital in Toronto. When I finally arrived at the hospital, the whole thing was a blur of morphine and anesthesia. When it was all completed, the final count was 17. 17 broken bones. I won't bore you by listing them all, but only my right hand was functional, and both my legs were unusable, with multiple fractures in each bone. Most importantly, I want to emphasize before I continue, I had suffered no head injuries, no concussions, nothing was cracked or broken. The only injury I had above my neck was a relatively small cut extending from my chin to my lip that only required seven stitches. The helmet had done its job. My head and cognitive functions were completely intact and uninjured. I stopped receiving visitors after about a week in the hospital. The trip from home to Toronto was too far for most people to make, so I spent much of my time alone watching television or reading. I tried to chat with the nurses when they came by, but they were often busy. Their visits were becoming infrequent as I continued to heal. One of them was at least kind enough to bring me a bowl of oranges. I've always loved oranges. And an interesting orange peeler that I could even operate with one hand. The peeler wasn't one of those cheap orange plastic ones. It was elegant and made of stainless steel. The body shaped like a large conical apostrophe with a small shark fin for a blade. The blade was sharp and precise enough that I could rest the orange on the table and use my palm to keep the orange immobile while I peeled away the outer skin of the orange, grasping the peeler between my index and middle fingers, steady by my thumb. It was tedious work, but I didn't have anything better to do. It took hours, but I finished nearly half the bowl that first day. Later that night, past normal visiting hours and after my last routine visit from the nurse, I was startled awake when I heard the door handle jingle and slowly turn with a click, opening as the faint sounds from the lobby entered the room briefly and then grew silent as the door shut and the lock clicked. There was a privacy curtain blocking my view from the door, so all I could do was listen and watch as the silhouette came closer to my bed. The footsteps were slow, uneven, and shuffling. Every other dragging footstep was punctuated by a loud thud echoing from the hard, white tiles. The shuffle shuffle thud grew nearer and louder as thumping in my chest grew faster and almost deafening. The silhouette was right up against the curtain, the figure tall and emaciated, almost skeletal, holding a long object in his right hand that extended to the floor. The left hand, blotchy and aged, 
extending and curling each finger one at a time around the privacy curtain until it was grasped firmly. I heard the metallic scrape and saw the flurry of fabric as the curtain was drawn back to reveal the figure that stood behind it. Relief spread through me as I saw the old man leaning on his cane, dressed in doctor's whites. The red letter stitched on his coat revealed that he was from the anesthesiology department. His name wasn't listed underneath his department, as is customary, but I had already noticed that many doctors' names weren't there. I'd imagine each department keeps spares around just in case the personalized ones get dirty or forgotten at home. I was amazed that a man this old was still practicing medicine. He was unbelievably skinny and appeared brittle, like the slightest breeze might cause him to sway and then crack under the motion. The only hair he had left was his bushy, white eyebrows and the white hair that was sticking out of his ears and nostrils. But the most remarkable thing about him was his skin. It was saggy and wrinkled like you would expect from someone his age, but he had age spots and marks like I had never seen. It was blotchy all over, the shades changing every few inches, like a quilt. There were some places where he had ivory skin, other places where it was completely black, and scattered about was every shade in between. He approached my bed with a couple more shuffles, drew a chair closer to him with his cane, and sat down with a soft thud near my left side. He still hadn't said anything, and he continued his silence as he looked at me. He looked at me in a way that no one had ever done before. It was like he was checking me out, but it was much more intense and longing. That's when the relief I had been feeling quickly dissipated, and my heart monitor started beeping wildly as he looked at my hair, my forehead, my eyes, my nose scanning every inch of me until his eyes rested on my toes. A smile crept onto his lips that revealed his unnaturally white and abnormally pointed teeth as he turned his face back toward the table where the oranges sat and then back to my face before he finally spoke. Your oranges look delicious. You wouldn't mind if I had one, would you? His last sentence did not end with an upward annotation of a question, but rather with the emphatic declaration of a command. He took one of the oranges off the table, and his eyes widened and positively gleamed as he saw the steel orange peeler. He picked it up lovingly and cradled it back and forth in his hands, as his mouth widened slightly and his eyes sparkled like a child at Christmas. He smiled as he touched the thin blade to the orange and punctured the skin. A fine mist sprang out as the smell of citrus overwhelmed the previously pervading sterile, antiseptic smell. Amazingly, his hands adeptly cut the orange, and he made an intricate swirling design in the orange peel. I know it sounds odd, but it was almost like he was creating art as he was peeling it. It was beautiful and captivating. He finished and pulled the peel off in one large ribbon. He looked down in wonderment at the hand that held the peeler, and he muttered to himself, Extraordinary, as he proceeded to throw the orange into the trash leaving the peel dangling in his hand. He leaned his head back, elevated his hand above himself, and dropped the end of the orange skin ribbon into his mouth. He slowly let the entire peel coil in his mouth, moaning with pleasure, as the last of it landed in his mouth and he began to chew, savoring each bite with closed eyes. Once he swallowed, his gaze returned to me, and he reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a syringe. Before I could say anything or even press the button to call a nurse, he had inserted the needle into the IV tube. I felt a coldness enter my arm where the IV entered, and the cold quickly spread throughout my entire body, freezing it immediately. I could not move. I tried to scream, but my mouth wouldn't open. I tried to scream with my mouth closed, but my vocal cords didn't work. He withdrew the needle from the tube and tossed the syringe aside into the biomedical waste bin, as he explained. I have injected you with a neurotoxin that I have specially developed that induces temporary but complete paralysis. It also comes with the side benefits that you can't talk or make any noise, but you should be able to see, hear, and feel everything that's going on. You simply won't be able to react. It makes my work much easier. 
He took a scalpel out of his coat pocket and examined it, looking at the blade before he nicked his thumb slightly, making it bleed. He looked at both the blood and the blade seemingly repulsed, and he threw the scalpel where he'd thrown the syringe. He picked up the orange peeler, and a wide smile spread across his lips. He started talking, first, I think, to himself, but then it turned into talking to me. Beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if I've ever seen anything more exquisite. Don't know why I've been using a scalpel all these years. Such precision and elegance. I'm excited to use this on you. It will be wonderful. He got himself right next to the bed and leaned over me. He lifted up my shirt and placed the peeler on my navel before he continued to explain. Before I begin, I like to tell my patients about why I do what I do so that you know that you're part of a good cause. That you're saving a life. Without this, I will fall apart and die. I must eat skin to live. Today, I must eat your skin to live. Remember how I mentioned that people always describe traumatic experiences like they happen in slow motion? This was one of those. He grabbed the orange peeler from off my belly button, he lifted it up into the air, and he buried the small blade into my abdomen. Silent screams filled my head as the pain overwhelmed me. He dug the peeler around in elaborate designs all around my stomach, using my belly button as a central point but never touching it. His expression was one of concentration, creative abandon, and insanity. A sadistic Van Gogh. After he finished his design, he returned the blade to the point of origin and set the peeler down. Between his untrimmed, yellow fingernails, he gripped the end of the peeled skin and lifted. He lifted as high as he could and I saw more and more of my skin being lifted from my body. He still hadn't reached the end of the skin ribbon when he tilted his head back and began to savoringly drop the end into his open mouth, his tongue licking the bloody side as it came down. He did this until there was no more skin left above his head, only the skin remaining on my belly. He licked his fingers, skin still protruding from his mouth, and then he began to suck. He sucked the skin into his mouth and chewed the whole time as he brought more in. Each centimeter of skin entered between his lips, blood splattering around his face and onto the floor, like epidermal linguine. The trail of skin finally ended, and the last inch entered his mouth with a slurp. He let out another one of his satisfied moans as he licked his fingers again. He looked back up at my face, my eyes and cheeks wet from tears and said, Thank you. Oh, that's much better. He looked back down at the orange peeler. You wouldn't mind if I keep this, would you? Again, it wasn't a question. It was a command. He picked it up and balanced it on top of his cane. He tore some medical tape from off a cast on my arm, and he used it to lash the peeler to the cane like a crowning jewel atop a scepter. He smiled at it once he finished. He stood up and slowly shuffled and thudded to the door. He unlocked and opened it. I heard the quiet sounds from the lobby, and then they disappeared as the door closed behind him. They found me early in the morning once I was finally able to move and push the button to call the nurse. They moved me into the psych ward, talking about PTSD. They told me there was no old man, that the wounds were self-inflicted. I know they weren't. I wore a helmet. I was careful. 